love you for it, God. Amen. Let's get the lights if we would just turn around and greet somebody next to you. Teenagers, you can be dismissed. I think you're ready to go into your classes today. So uh, the teenagers can go to their class. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Praise God. Good to see all of you here today in the house of the Lord. I thought we was going to have to have sponge baths instead of showers. This electricity finally came back on. Amen. But uh, I appreciate the Lord today. appreciate all that God is doing. And uh, it's amazing how all, every song, it seems like, went right along with what I want to talk about today. Amen. And... Uh, uh, God's been dealing with me about this for uh, two or three weeks now, so uh, I've been working on it especially hard the last two or three days, and uh, I was just about to had it in my computer and was just about to put the last sentence on my notes and the electricity this morning said, Phew. I said, oh, no. <laughs> I said, Lord, I had it on auto save. Please let it be saved <laughs> when the electricity comes back on. And it was saved. So I thank God I didn't have to retype all that stuff. <laughs> I'd have never made it in time. But uh, I appreciate the Lord. And uh, and I'm on a, we may have prayer at the end, uh, the end of the service today. And uh and um, it just like I said, it's amazing how that all the songs talk about just what I want to talk about. I want to read it for text. I want to read in the book of Matthew chapter 21, uh, chapter 7, I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 7. Uh, and this is going to be reading from the Amplified Version. And I chose it for a reason. Uh, it just goes a little deeper uh, in the Greek explanation of what's really in the word. For instance, the word blessed. Uh, so we say, blessed are they that mourn. Uh, that kind of seems like a contradiction, doesn't it? <laughs> but uh, uh, there's a lot in that word uh, blessed when you uh, deal with it in the Greek. So I wanted to read it because it really digs into the Greek pretty heavy here. Uh, when I, but I'm not in this text so much we're going to be reading, but in the second one I'm going to be reading when I get into the... To the now this what this is, this is the text at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount starts in chapter 5 and goes all the way through chapter 7. And uh, this is the tail end of what Jesus was teaching. And we're going to go back to the Sermon on the Mount, but I wanted to read what he said he concluded when he got through telling you how to do life and how to live life. And you got to realize Jesus was coming to, uh, to this earth to establish a spiritual kingdom among a group of people at that point in time that very, very few, other than a few prophets and a few special men, knew anything about living in the Spirit. Most people had the knowledge of God from the Word. That was about it. But they didn't have the power of the Spirit in their life to help them accomplish what, you know, the Word was saying. And uh, so... He was coming to establish a spiritual kingdom in a carnal world, actually, where people didn't know anything about. They were, the Jews always looked for a physical kingdom. They always thought it was going to be a physical king, a physical thing set up in Jerusalem. And some people still teach that. And uh, it's not true, but they teach it. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not looking for a physical king in Jerusalem. My king already came 2,000 years ago. And... Uh, he did what he intended to do. He's still the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. And there will not be another after him. He is going to be the last one. I promise you that. And uh, so I want to uh, talk about this. I want to read the last part. So basically he's saying, now after I give you all this foundational teaching, he lets us know there's going to be some things that's going to test what he's given us and when we start living it. And we'll start it in verse 21. There's a lot of places we can start it. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, which is in heaven. It's not everybody that calls him Lord or calls on any name of the Lord is going to be saved. It's just, it's going to be those that's doing the will. 
and we're obeying his word, obeying what he's taught us, doing what he's commanded us to do. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and driven out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? Then I will say to them openly, publicly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who act wickedly, disregarding my commands. Remember, these people disregarded his commands. Even though they were casting out devils, they thought they were. I'm sure they were. Uh, they uh, had all kind of things happen in their lives in a spiritual sense, but they didn't obey the commands, these foundational things that he laid down, and he said, I never even knew you. And, of course, he tells us at the beginning of that one reason for this is beware of false prophets. In other words, false prophets have deceived a lot of people with false messages, and people have taught a lot of false things, okay? So... He learns how some of this can take place. But I'm not here to deal with that today. And uh, <clears throat> she said, So everyone who hears these say words of mine and acts upon them, obeying them, will be like a sensible, prudent, practical, wise man who built his house upon a rock. She said, When you hear all these things, and when he started in chapter 5, when you hear all these things I've taught, and you obey them, be like building on a rock. He said, and the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew, beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it was founded on the rock. And the one in words that founded on the rock, they were obedient to it, they obeyed it, and they did it, they established. And uh, there's another scripture in the Old Testament that says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And we're just got to be established on truth, <coughs> it's got to be established on relationship, got to be established on purity. He said, and everyone who hears these words of mine <coughs> and does not do them will be like to a stupid, foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house. He said, <coughs> and it fell, and great and complete was the fall of it. So what he's doing here, giving us a picture that uh, you can be established on the rock or you can be established in the sand. He said, because the flood is coming. The storm is coming to life. In other words, every one of us is going to go through storms of life. And the wind, the rain, the flood did come. And it's going to come to every one of our lives. It will come, uh, and, and uh, the storms of life that he's talking about here, represents things that's going to come to oppose us during this lifetime. It could be a form of persecution. It could be a form of abuse, which the Bible calls revile. When you revile, the word revile means abuse. Somebody's abusing you. When you revile, revile not again. Uh, in other words, uh, that means abuse you. It could be someone abusing you, someone slandering you. It could be a sickness. It could be financial struggles. There's a lot of other forms of uh, the things of struggles and storms that come to our life. And uh, I didn't even name them all. You may be going through one that I didn't name. There's just too many of them to name. They can come from so many directions. But anyway, to anything that opposes us that, at what we're trying to do and get done. And uh, but, but I feel like before we can really understand uh, all about this, we first of all need to understand God's will for our lives in the earth. What is he trying to do? Now, he revealed much of our purpose and how we're going to live and supposed to live in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 through 7, uh, which is uh, basically, I read the last part of that. So we want to go back now and uh, try to go in uh, I'm going to make a statement, and we're going to go read Matthew 5. I'm going to start in the first part of that and just read quickly some of that. Now, Jesus came to establish a, I'm going to just say it in my own words. He came to establish a spiritual kingdom in a world that didn't know nothing about it. you got to realize this. These people don't have a clue while he's talking. That's just like, give an example, Nicodemus, when he told him, you've got to be born again or you can't see the kingdom. Nicodemus thought he was talking about a natural birth. He knew nothing about spiritual birth. So he says, can I enter the second time into my mother's womb and be born? And he realized you've got to be born of water and of the Spirit. 
or you can't enter the kingdom. And so we realize we got to understand that these people really did not realize what Jesus was trying to establish. I read a book once called Messianic Ideas in Judaism because I've done a lot of study about Jews and Judaism and, and all that stuff. And uh, the big difference in the beliefs is that in Judaism, they believe that the kingdom of God is natural. They believe it's a, a physical thing that's going to be like established in the earth. And Christianity believes that it's a spiritual thing that's established in the hearts of God's people. And that's the big differences in it. And, uh, and they actually c come up with a doctrine to try to promote that more and more and put it in the church, and the church swallowed hook, line, and sinker. But uh, I disagree with it, don't believe it. And uh, so basically these people here, they were controlled by the figures of the flesh, yet he's going to forgive their sins. He's going to fill them with his spirit, and he's going to empower them to obey his will, and not only that, but to represent his kingdom in the earth. Now, this is where Jesus is going with his purpose. He's going to transform, he's going to empower, and he's going to uh, make them people that's going to represent his kingdom in the earth. <laughs> but when he starts talking, they don't really have a clue. But he's giving them a foundation in these chapters uh, and most people have futurized the kingdom. You know, a lot of people have futurized the kingdom. They, it's not something we can have here. They, so something that they feel is just too hard here, they just futurize it. Well, that's going to be someday, you know. That'll be when we get to heaven. Or that'll be, uh, you know, when the Lord comes. That'll be, but actually, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his message that started this whole uh, chapter here, right before he started this, uh, uh, this Sermon on the Mount. He was preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's right here. It's right ready to start. It's right ready to begin. And so he came to establish this kingdom. Uh, so uh, let me start here and let's just read some of this <laughs> with uh, chapter 5. And we'll start with, with verse 1. And most of the reading is up front on this. The long reading is. Seeing the crowds, and this is once again the Amplified. Seeing the crowds, he went up in the mountain and when he was... Seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed, which is, now this is where he's going to describe the word blessed. So he says, blessed. Then he, in parentheses, he puts the Greek, what that's really saying. He said, happy to be envied and spiritually prosperous <coughs> with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of their outward conditions. <coughs> now, I thought that was pretty well the core of what I'm trying to preach today. Regardless of your outward conditions. In other words, <coughs> this is what, and we're blessed actually means happy. We're blessed. We're happy. We're to be envied. We're spiritually prosperous. We got life. We got joy. We got satisfaction in God. We got peace. We got God's favor, and that's regardless of our outward situations. <coughs> and see, an outward situation could be called a storm of life, and it's not the will of God for us to not remain steadfast in God during any storm or outward opposition that ever comes to our life. I'm not saying we have control over that. I'm saying we can pray about it. We can t try to take dominion over it. We can speak against it. I've seen God remove them a lot of times, but I've seen times he absolutely made me walk through it. Right. But if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he's right there with me. <laughs> so whatever he puts us through, he'll go with us through it. But he does not want us to be affected by it to the point we don't remain stable in him. Amen. And uh, it's kind of like an old song uh, talking about it just drives me to my knees. And there while I'm in prayer, I want to sing that victory song. I'll be up again. Just you wait to see. Sometimes these situations drive us to prayer, but that should make us closer to God. You know, that should bring us closer to what he's want. He said, so he said, uh, are the, blessed are the poor in spirit. That means the humble. That don't mean you've got a bad spirit or poor spirit. That means the humility who rate themselves insignificant. And where you, you're, you're just, you don't see yourself as the big 
person that's got to be recognized. You have a lot of humility. The Bible talks a lot about preferring your brother, loving your brother. In words, not being the front, have to be up front and be the leader in everything. Nothing wrong with being a leader. I've been a, I've been a leader in the pulpit for years, but there's nothing wrong with that. But I realize that God is the one that we're trying to glorify here. Because you've got a lot of leaders, you've got a lot of pulpits, okay? He said, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, when you live with this attitude, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed and inviolably uh, happy with the happiness produced by the experience of God's favor and a special condition by the revelation of His Master's grace are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed, happy, blissome, joy, spiritually prospered with life, joy, and satisfaction of God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions, are the meek, the mild, patient, long-suffering, those meek people that's uh, a lot of humility in them. They shall inherit the earth. All right? Amazing. Now, it takes a lot of prayer about that and a lot of revelation. They're going to inherit the earth. We'll just, we'll just let that ride for now. Blessed and fortunate and happy and spiritually prosperous in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, uprightness, and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. When you hunger for that, when you seek that, you know, Jesus said, seek and you shall find. That's also in this portion of these chapters I'm talking about. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it be open. Ask and you shall receive. So when you're hungry, and just like David said, my soul panteth after God, just like a deer panteth after a water brook. He said, when you're hungry for God, you want the things of God, you desire God, you want to please God. That's the kind of people that Jesus said is going to make up my kingdom. Blessed, happy, this is verse 7, to be envied and spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions, are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed, happy, and vibably, Fortunate and spiritually prosperous, processing the happiness produced in the experience of God's favor and especially conditioned by His revelation of grace, regardless of their out conditions, are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They're going to see God. And then, then he talks about, let me just skip part of that because it, it gets long, but just repeating itself. Blessed are the, he talked about, are the peacemakers, are the maintainers of peace because they're going to be called the sons of God. But he used to, all this means regardless of your outward condition because of what God's given you on the inside. Okay, so he's laying a foundation for his kingdom. Then he talks about uh, blessed are those uh, who are persecuted for righteous sake, for being and doing right, for theirs is the kingdom of God. When you get persecuted for doing right, yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed, uh, I'm skipping all that, trying to get all that again. Are they when men revile you, I mean abuse you, and persecute you, and say all kinds of things against you falsely on my account. Now, how are we supposed to respond to that? He's teaching you. How, this is what you've got to learn in my kingdom. And now, how do we handle that when people start running us down, criticizing us, jumping on us, treating us bad, you know, slandering us or whatever, be glad and supremely joyful for your reward in heaven is great, strong and intense. For in the same way people persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, he's saying you, you got to understand when something comes against you externally from the outside, you're sealed on the inside. You got God. You got His grace. You got. I think I just blew my mic off. But anyway, uh, you got that inside there. And uh, he said, "This what you the peace, the the power of God, the strength of God, regardless of these outward conditions. You got these things there with you. And so when they come at you, just rejoice and be exceeding glad. So people do that sometimes. People that don't have a revelation of the fruits of the Spirit." They're raised in an experience. Some people have experience with God, but they've never matured. 
Because God, this, the thing about maturity we teach about is really real, folks. I'm going to tell you. Yeah, I'm going to read something about that a little bit. It's really real. Getting people mature to the point they don't react in the flesh. They react in the spirit and uh, react to the fruits of the spirit. And this is what he's talking about here in, in this account. And uh, so uh, this is what he's trying to get us to be able to do. The other day, my wife was in a store just shopping in a, a family she knew from uh, older times. They were kind of, kind of a Pentecostal background, began to tell her how ungodly she was, how she was going to hell, and all this stuff like that right there in the store. That's really encouraging, isn't it? So told her all the things she was doing wrong and how unholy and ungodly she was and all this stuff. See, some people are hung up on certain things that's a tradition in their mind, and they don't realize that what's coming out of their mouth is just as much ungodly, because the Bible said preach the truth in love. And, and to start criticizing someone, you know, even if you believe they're different from them, to jump on them about their difference like that in a public place and begin just to run them down, the Bible said an offended brother is harder to win than a strong city. You're not going to win them like that. Come on. Come on. Amen. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a shame that some people think they can put on God enough that they have a right to judge others. Because one of the statements in this, in this Sermon on the Mount is don't judge a brother. Don't judge anybody. Because whatever how you judge them, it's going to be turning back to you. He said, you hypocrite, you first get that beam out of your eye, then you might be able to see you get the splinter out of your brother's eye. He said, because as you judge others, this is part of the foundational thing he laid in the Sermon on the Mount. Don't be going around judging your brother, because he said, as you judge others, it's going to be meted back to you. So we got to understand that God, no matter how much we, uh, we got to rest we got to restrain this flesh, we got to restrain our attitudes, why? Because he tells us right here where he's going with it. Why? Why we got to do all this? Why we got to accept all this? Why we got to rejoice when we're persecuted? He said, verse 30, you are the salt of the earth. And the salt that's lost its taste or its savor, says King James, its strength, its quality, how can its saltness be restored? It is not good, uh, good for anything any longer but to be thrown out and trodden under foot of men. And that's exactly what happened to Jerusalem. Jerusalem refused the new covenant, wanted to stay in the old. They lost being the salt of the earth. The church became the salt of the earth. So Jerusalem became trodden under foot of men. It's because they didn't, uh, they didn't want to be the salt of the earth. And Jesus had a church that was going to become the salt of the earth. And so uh, he said, you're the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a, a bushel or, or a peck, it says here, measure, but on a lampstand. You don't light a light. This morning, I'd give anything for a candle. I had nothing but my cell phone light trying to find my way around here. I had that fellow with three or four of them chairs in there. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble and good deeds recognize and honor and praise you no honor your father who is in heaven see we're it's calling the people to live different from the rest of the world because you go to talking about a world person they probably gonna turn around and pop you in the nose right i mean you go to criticizing people uh out there like that because that's flesh 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 don't. Flesh is not going to live like Jesus outlined. We got to live in these two chapters. I'm going to tell you, five, six, and seven. These three chapters. He did. We're, flesh can't live and obey what this was outlined to live. There's no way it can do it. Amen. And uh, it says in Ephesians and Ezekiel pro, in prophecy. Uh, so what he's done, he's coming to establish this kingdom that we can be salt and light in the world. So in Ezekiel, this prophecy. Uh, 36, 26 to 27, a new heart will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. Really, I think cause 
there's a better word would say empower because he don't force okay God does not force but he empowers you to walk in his statute you shall heed my ordinances and do them this was prophecy now look in Luke chapter 17 verses 20 and 21 he said now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come he answered and said the kingdom of God does not come with observation nor will they say lo here or there for indeed the kingdom of God is where within you then what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is nothing more than the Spirit of God inside of us, leading and directing our life, where He comes inside of us through a born again experience and directs our path from that point on in life that we will let Him. Now, and there's also, you have a choice, because also there's scriptures about following the flesh or following the Spirit. Because I tell people, some people got the Holy Ghost that the Holy Ghost don't got them. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, they, got, they got the Holy Ghost one time, but uh, their flesh is still ruling their life. And when I get LT on my throne, I'm in trouble. I need to keep JC on my throne. You know, because I can override what the Spirit is telling me, or I can yield to what the Spirit is telling me. Now, what is this kingdom? It's, just, it's the Spirit of God inside of you to empower you to do His will and be a witness in the earth. Now, Romans 14, 17 talks a little bit about it. It said, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking. They would already go over eating and drinking and being righteous under the law and all that, and offending a brother. And he said, It's not about eating and drinking. It's not about eating and drink. But righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, when you get the Spirit of God in you, it gives you righteousness, now, I want you to understand, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The reason it says in the Holy Ghost, because if you study the Scriptures carefully, I didn't have time to go put all this in there, you'll find that the Bible teaches He's given you His righteousness, Amen. imputed righteousness. He's given you His joy. He said, my joy I will give unto you. He's given you His peace. And it's not just any peace. It's a peace that passeth all understanding. It's a peace that will keep you steady during the storm. It's a joy that you will have when the storm is raging from all sides. I'm telling you, he'll keep you, that you'll stay right there steadfast. You'll be unmovable during the storm. It won't change your attitude. It won't, if anything, it'll make you closer to God. That's what I'm telling about people that get tested and go through trials. You're either going to get bitter or you're going to get better. You're going to be one of the two. You'll get bitter or you'll get better. Hopefully you'll get better. Praise God. Now, in the book of John, he talked about how we get the Spirit. Jesus answered, talking about Nicodemus, talking to Nicodemus, answered and said unto him, Most assuredly I say unto you, verse 3, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he the second time in his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say unto you, Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So how are you going to be in the kingdom without the Spirit of God? See, people that don't believe in receiving the Spirit of God. Uh, you know, that's the thing about you know, I'm a kind of a, they call me a partial preterist or preterist to you. I, I believe a lot of stuff is fulfilled that actually was symbolic language and was fulfilled at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. I believe that. I teach that. That's why I believe teach the kingdom. We're in the kingdom now, okay? And, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's a view that I have. And, uh, and uh, But a lot of these guys that believe like me came out of, Churches that don't believe they get up and they say there's no now no more supernatural that uh, from 70 A.D. on there's no more supernatural. There's no more miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, let me say this. If there wasn't any more miraculous, I wouldn't have that revelation they have. Because God showed it to me in prayer. I didn't read their books, didn't even know they existed. If it wasn't for God speaking to me and talking to me, and telling me what to read and where to go and 
I'd be in my office. And I was in my office one day when I was debating over Matthew 24 being fulfilled. And the Lord spoke to me just as clear as I'm speaking to you. He said, get up and read Barnes Notes, Matthew 24. Well, I'd had Barnes Notes in my, up on top of my shelf for years, and I never opened it. I went and got Barnes Notes and opened it, and guess what? He said, Matthew 24 was fulfilled in 70 A.D. Wow. I now saw Clark's commentary. I said, I wonder what Clark says. I got Clark down. Matthew 24, he said, was fulfilled in 70 A.D. with the destruction of Jerusalem. I said, what? So what's God doing? God's showing me stuff. He began to see if you honest and open. Because, see, God had to get us out of a Pentecostal ex- understanding where we just depend on experience. Now, some people that get an experience with God, they still feel like what, if, if somebody makes them angry, they still have a right because they've been angered. They have a right to be angry back. They have a right to, you know, be mad or to be, but see, that's exactly the opposite of what God teaches. And they get get an experience with God, but they never do go on and develop maturity. That's the problem right there. You can't just be born and stay a baby the rest of your life, run around messing in your britches. You got to someday grow up and clean yourself up, you know. So you can take care of yourself and you walk like you should walk and be able to stand strong. And when these trials come in life, we have to be able to stand firm in these trials and answer them like men, a men of God, men and women of God. Because we've matured enough now that we're not children anymore, tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. But we're mature men of God walking into the image of Christ and understand it's not his will to ever respond to anything in the flesh. It's his will. To respond to everything in life, good and bad, in the Spirit of God. We never are excused. If you fail, it's a sin. I mean, you just have to repent. I failed before and had to repent. So, you know, I've had some things here lately. I'm probably more mature right now than I've ever been in my life when it comes to trying to walk in the fruits of the Spirit. I'm probably more mature right now in that area. There's been times I've been had more strength to pray and fast and walk in dimensions of God and stuff like that. But as far as just maturity, I've got my mind made up. There ain't nothing going to happen to me and ain't nothing coming my way that's going to cause me to not speak after the fruits of the Spirit. You just got to walk with that determination. So when people come up to you and start a bunch of mess, you just be determined, just smile at them. I've had people cheat me out of money. I've had people lie to me. I've had people slander me. I've had all, you know, I'm not, don't feel sorry for me. I mean, it's just, God, I needed that. God needed to mature me. He needed to mature me. And, and when I fail, that's my sign to me. I wouldn't mature yet. I got some more growing to do. And if you're too big to ever apologize, you really got a problem. Because you cannot get your prayers answered. Because he said, if you got out against a brother, and you want to come tell me something, you better go make it right with your brother if you want me to hear you. He said, matter of fact, if you don't forgive your brother, when you come to me, I'm not going to forgive you. You know, he's not a little old play around God. He's mean. He's laying a foundation down here. Now, if we're willing to follow it, he's, boy, we're, I mean, it's easy to do. We're right there. It's not hard living for God. We just got to make up our mind. We're not going to let the flesh take us over. Praise God. And so uh, so we got to get his spirit. Now here, I'm going to read a couple of Old Testament prophecies, New Testament right quick. The Old Testament prophecy, he uh, said uh, in Jeremiah 24, 7, Then will I give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return unto me with their whole heart. And part of chapter 6 in the Sermon on the Mount deals with living with a single mind, a single heart. No man can serve two masters. You're either going to love one, hate the other. And if your eye is single, which is your mind, your whole body's full of light or revelation, understanding of God. But if it's not single, you're trying to serve God and the world and everything else. He said, you can't do it. You had to make up your mind if you're going to serve me. I'm going to tell you, you can't please everybody. 
I'm beginning to decide if I can ever please anybody. But you know, except the Lord. I, you know, if I please somebody, I want to please Him. But you know, there's a lot of people going to criticize you no matter what you do, praise God. So you just can't worry about that. And I got God speak to me one time. I, when I was going through all that persecution uh, with the organization I was in, and there was a lot of slander going on, telling things I didn't believe, never believed in my life. And, but it would make, make good material to keep people listening to what you got to say. But I was struggling with all that. And the Lord told me, spoke to me right there, and he said, you got a problem. And when God speaks to you, he, I mean, I've, I've heard the voice of God so much, I can hear it with an attitude. And God had an attitude. He said, you got a problem, just like that. I mean, he said in a southern voice, so I could make sure I understood. <laughs> See, God ain't from the south. I don't know. He speaks all dialects. <laughs> he relates to who needs to be related to. I get on the phone with some of these folks trying to get things done now. I can't even understand what they're saying. I don't even know where they're from. They got so many accents out there, I didn't even know what they were. One guy, what you want to enjoy? I said, man, what are you speaking? I said, God, I'm, get me somebody who knows how to speak English. You got anybody from the south up there? <laughs> yeah, we got our own dialect, like Bub. I ain't Bob, that's Bub. We got our own thing. God said, you got a problem. And I got a feeling when he told me that, I got a feeling he wasn't going to be long in telling me. And he didn't waste no time. He come right back with the answer and let me know what it was. He said, and he told him in this crazy way, I never will forget how he said it. He said, you care too much about what men think. And what you worrying too much about what people are saying about you more than you are about focusing on men. You just need to let that stuff Forget about it, because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I can take care of all that. So I did what I could. I got it out there on the Internet. People listened to it. I just got an email yesterday. I don't even know who they are. Thank you, Pastor. I've been listening to all your tapes on YouTube on eschatology and teaching and everything else, he said, thank God for a man of God that's still preaching truth. He said, not a lot of pastors doing that anymore. They're afraid to preach truth. So I get one guy, I moved from Australia the other day, man, you know where I can find a church like yours in Australia? I said, man, I don't even know where we can find a church like ours in Texas. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. We're weirdos out here, praise God. We're different from everybody, praise God. But, uh, I can't help you in Australia, that's for sure. All I'm to do is follow us online, go sh shout with somebody, amen. But, uh, you know, he said, uh, he said here, uh, with your whole heart. And then as Ezekiel 27, 30, 37, I'm sorry, 23, another prophecy. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols. This is what God's going to do. Nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgression, but I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned, will cleanse them. They shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now let me read a New Testament fulfillment, 2 Corinthians 6, 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, walk among them, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now we've got God walking right inside of us. You know what my Bible says? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And there's times that I've tested this God inside of me. Like somebody doing a thing with faith. I was in home missions work. I owed the government $1,800 once. Eighteen hundred something dollars. I looked at my checking account. I had nineteen cents. I wrote a check for eighteen hundred something dollars. I said, "God, you got two weeks to cover this." <laughs> and He covered it with a miracle. I don't recommend that unless you got faith, <laughs> or you're crazy, you're apostolic guy, yeah, you know. But there's times that I've I've walked into demon possessions. Where demons were talking to me out of someone, and I walked right up in their face, talked to them, 
cast the devil out of them, got them delivered by the power of God, and they're still living for God today. So, I mean, I've watched the God inside of me prove himself. When big men were going to rail on me, and God just set them down, they couldn't even move. I felt it happen. You know, we've seen these things. We've watched it. We've been blessed by a lot of miracles. But I also had my share of storms in my life, too. You know, we like to talk about the good things, but there's uh, some hard things that come our way sometimes, too. But God said, I'm going to be right there with you. Because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. And uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through uh, uh, 20 Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things become new. This is our purpose. This is why I'm reading in Scripture, purpose. Now, all things are of God who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now, he's given us. Now, we are ambassadors for Christ. So he's given us the word of reconciliation for the world. He's given his spirit, put a word inside of us, and we're representing Christ to the world. We're salt. We're light. We're, we're, we're here to, for a purpose in life, every one of us. You may not be in a pulpit, but you are in a pulpit. Paul talked about one time how that one church was such a light and such a witness to people that they didn't have to say anything. You know, we're, we're called here. We are the body, the temple, the salt, the light, ambassadors, representing his kingdom to reconcile the word of God. There's two main ways that's going to happen, witnessing to them in word and deed, which is by living and speaking after the fruits of the Spirit right in the midst of the people who know nothing about living after the Spirit. They know about living after the flesh. You slap me, I'm slapping you back. You get me, I'm getting you back. I'm getting you worse. You cheat me, I'm cheating you worse. Now, i tell you what really changed my life. I've got to hurry here because I'm going to get bogged down in a lot of Scripture and then not be able to, I may not read all this. When God gave me the revelation of the river of life, and I preached two messages here on it just right after my wife died, and uh, he began to show me that... Uh, that river of life issues out from the house of God, and it, its waters is ankle deep, knee deep. What it is, it's places of maturity till there's waters to swim in. And everywhere that river went, it, it healed and brought, gave life. What is this? A picture of the Spirit of God coming out of the church. He said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. In that new Jerusalem, which is the picture of the church, is a river of life. I'm going to tell you what the river of life is. It's the words we speak after the fruits of the Spirit that come forth from our life and it's led of the Spirit. And that's what that is. That's what that's a picture of. It's a picture of the church going forth, speaking after the fruits of the Spirit from our lives, and we're witnessing to a world that's lost and needing water, and we're feeding them the things of God. That's what that's a picture of right there, a picture of the Spirit of God. And when I saw that, it, it, it done something to me. That revelation changed my life more than all the other revelations I've had together. And, uh, and then when I realized, James said, He that controls the tongue the same as a perfect man. What is the word perfect? It's mature. God's trying to bring us to maturity. And then James went on to say that a fountain don't bring forth bitter and sweet water, not the same one. He said, and a mouth can't speak cursing and blessing. By the same mouth can't come cursing and blessing. So I realized that it's never the will of God for me to get angry enough or mad enough or frustrated enough in my flesh to speak after the flesh, to respond in anger. Because we feel justified if somebody angers us. And when I saw that, it changed my life, and I had to make a whole another commitment to God. Because I remember all the times I failed in that one, but I felt justified, see, because somebody had wronged me. Even though I was spirit-filled, I felt like I had a right because they wronged me to come back at them 
from my flesh and respond in my flesh. And I really did not have that right according to God because that's when you lose your witness. Is this making any sense? But see, God brought a people that's going to respond not the way the world would respond, but the way the Spirit would respond. And that's, and that, and that's what it's all about. And so well, what are the works of the flesh? There may be some new people here. I'm going to read it quickly. In Galatians chapter 5, throw this up here. So in case some people have never seen this. Uh, 5, 19. I'm not going to read all around it. If I did, it would be powerful. But Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outburst of wrath, uh, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelry, reveries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just have told you in time past, these who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. For those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not be conceited, provoking one another, ending one another. Did you know if the whole church would get this revelation and live out to the fruits of the Spirit on a continuous basis, there'd never be any church trouble? Did you know everybody in that church would love one another? Did you know everybody in that church would forgive one another? Did you know there wouldn't be anybody in that church that had something bad against the other? Hello? Because you can't. You've got to get rid of it. You've got to get it out. You've got to let it go. And sometimes that's the hardest thing in the world. It's just let it go. He said, he said against such, he talks about gentleness and self-control, against such there is no law. For those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we've got we to realize there's no law against the fruits. It's only a law against sin. Now, Romans 8, 13, 14 says, if you live according to the flesh, you're going to die. But if you, by the Spirit, do put the deeds, death, the deeds of the body, you'll live. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So what's he wanting? He's wanting his church to come to full growth and be responsible, live out the fruits of the Spirit. Look at Ephesians, where he talks about uh, uh, Ephesians 4, 11. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. We're supposed to work on this. Till we're supposed to grow up till we all are coming to the full stature of Jesus Christ. I'm not your example. Christ is your example. I'm trying to be like him, and you don't try to be like me. You be like him. The only time you follow me is when I'm following Christ. Paul said, you follow me as I follow Christ. And we've got to follow Christ. He's what we're trying to get to where it is. And it's not hard. You'd be surprised what this will do for your home, your children, your life, your work, your job. It takes all the mess out of it. Hello? Because when it comes in from the outside, it don't affect you. And... Uh, how do you know when I've arrived? When you can produce fruit in adversity. That's when you know you've arrived. Praise God. Now, let me read Matthew 5, 38, uh, 48, because I'm going to run out of time here before I get out of the deal. You ever heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth? I tell you not to resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, give him your cloak also. If it compels you to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asks you, from him who wants to borrow from you, don't turn away. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say you, you've got to love your enemy. Bless them that curse you, do good to those that hate you, pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Now that is the hardest commandment in the Bible right there. At least for me it is. I got to love and pray for somebody that's persecuting me and despitefully using me and talking about me and running me down. i got to love them and pray for them. That's hard. Mm -hmm. 
that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those that love you, what reward of you? Do not even the tax collectors the same? If you greet your brethren only, he said, what do you more than others? Do not the tax collectors do that? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What do you say mature? That word mature means you've got to be full maturity. When do we get full maturity in Christ? When we can have somebody cuss us out and we can smile at them. We have somebody cheat us, and we can still love them. When we can see somebody that's failing, instead of hating them, that we'll pray for them and ask God to strengthen them and get over that problem they got. See, his church, his true church, has got to mature way beyond the flesh. Because flesh says, you do it to me, I'm getting you back. Flesh says, they've done this to me, I ain't never fooling with them again. I had a man a few years ago, kept lying to me, he finally beat me out of $7,000. And uh, I said, I told him, I just sent him a text. I said, brother, I want you to know, I'm going to forgive you for what you've done. Now, what you do with that, the rest of it, is all up to you and God. But I'm going to forgive you for what you've done to me. And I'm going to pray for you. That hurt me for a long time because I, I ain't got just seven thousand dollars laying around, you know. Some of you might might not bother you, but that was a lot of money for me. But I don't have time to glean. I was gonna glean some more of the chapters and what it says about prayer. But you know it's the prayer he taught us. Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, this is the kingdom, bringing heaven to earth and living it right here. See, when you don't have a kingdom mindset, you got like a, a, a religious mindset. Everything's in the future, and you, you justify sin here on earth. It's like Job was a perfect example. Went from the richest man. Because God was bragging on him. You consider my servant Job. He hates evil. He's an upright man. Devil, let me let me just. That's because you got a hedge around him, God. Well, I'll remove it and let you touch him. You just can't touch his life. I want you to get out of this one thing. God controls the parameters of your trial, not the devil. You keep that in mind. And here's another one. I won't put on you more than you can bear. And with that temptation, I will make a way of escape. Keep that in mind. Because that's his word. And he don't fail his word. He lost all of his money in one day, all of his children in one day. The thing it said about Job, in all this, Job never sinned with his lips. Nor charged God freely. What was the judgment here? It was almost like God and the devil were betting. The devil was betting. He's going to fail. And God was saying, no, I trust him. He's not going to fail. You can go ahead and touch him. I'll prove you wrong, devil. They were actually almost like betting. They said. And Job was the poor old Job. He didn't know what was going on. He was just praying. <laughs> Next thing you know, he went to the, from the richest man in the east to the poorest. And one day, and all of his kids were dead. Tornado came and killed all of his children. Now, folks, that's not something easy to talk about. That's tough. Imagine you had seven kids and you lost them all just like that. That's rough. And his wife, won't you just curse God and die? She didn't hold up as good as Job did. Job said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. See, circumstances never affected the man's spirit. Yeah. 
So the, and then the devil said, let me touch his flesh. He'll curse you to your face then. Okay, but don't take his life. God set the parameters. He made him sick, boils everywhere. Oh, his wife saw that pitiful miracle. He just told him, well, though the skin worms destroy this flesh, yet in my flesh body, yet in my flesh I'm going to see God. He said, when I'm tried, I shall come forth as a prophet. And you know what? When his friends come over, you ever had friends like Job had? <laughs> I'm going to tell you how bad you sinned. That's why all that's happening to you. But you know what happened? Job stayed faithful. And you know what else happened? When Job prayed for his friends, he got totally restored, twice as much as he had in the beginning. Except God only gave him seven kids because he wasn't going to do that to nobody, give him 14 <laughs> And he got it all back. But you know why Job had to pray for his friends? Because God would not hear his friend's prayer. Read, read your Bible. He, he said, I'm not hearing their prayer. If they pray, I'm not going to hear them. You've got to pray for them. See, when you mess around with sin and junk and don't want to be obedient to the things of the Spirit and live out the fruit of the Spirit, you may, you may get to the point, somebody better pray for you because God may not want to hear you anymore. Only prayer he's obligated to answer is a repentant prayer. But these guys that were all religious and jacked up and judgmental didn't even know what they were talking about because they didn't know what God was doing. And then there's the Apostle Paul. If you read his resume, oh, my God, what that poor man went through. He saw all kind of miracles. He, he saw caught up to the third heaven, got revelations that he couldn't even reveal had to be given a thorn in the flesh to keep him humble, a messenger of Satan to buffet him. I believe it was a messenger of Satan reminding him of all the Christians he killed before he got converted so he wouldn't get uplifted in his flesh. He would stay humble in his flesh. Son, you read his resume, you'll make you want to resign and be an apostle. I'm telling you, it was tough. And... Uh, He said, if we're ministers to Christ, I speak as a fool. And labor is more abundant, stripes above measure, and prison more frequent, and deaths off. From the Jews, five times I've received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once with a stone. Three times with a shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And, and uh, journeys often in perils in water, and perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleepness as often, in hunger and thirst and fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides other things that comes upon me daily, you know, uh, deep concern for all the churches. He said, who's weak? I'm not weak. Who is made to stumble? I don't burn with indignation. If I'm going to boast, I'm going to boast in my infirmities. And he talked about it. I said, when I'm reviled, we don't revile back. When they talk about it, we don't do it back. We don't give them what they give us. We never refer out. I just don't have time to go read that. What he's saying is, even though I've been through all this, I've had the highs, I've had the lows. Probably the closest thing I ever got to a third heaven experience was when that time when God gave me that 14-day revelation, caught me up in the spirit and talked to me for 14 days. Probably the close. I believe all the third heaven there was was a was the probably the highest realm of revelation you could go right there in God with that, where God spoke to that man and gave him all kind of revelations in the spirit realm. And but you know these things that God gives us. I've heard the voice of God many times, had the blessings of God, but I've also had many things to suffer through that. And uh, we've been through a lot. I have been probably the last year, two years. I've really been through a lot, you know, lost a wife, we had a time of loneliness, and time that God gave me the revelation of the river of life, and I remarried a wife, we've had some tough times, probably some of the, two of the hardest years of my life in the last two years, you know, Shannon lost her dad about three weeks from the time I lost my wife, just, just everything just right there. We had a lot of deaths in this church. We had a lot of things we had to deal with. When I got married, when me and Delia were going together, 
was going to get married, then I found out I had prostate cancer. I gave her an out. I said, hey, you might want to pray about this. I'm not sure, you know. Don't feel, if you want out of this thing, I wouldn't blame you. She said, no, I'm not, I don't want out. I want you to take those treatments. Because she'd lost her first husband to cancer. But God had given me that revelation. And, uh, you know, I've had, uh, she's had a lot of sicknesses this past year. I think we met her deductible, $5,500 in February, January or February. She just had major surgery again. Uh, I've had all kinds of stuff. I had the heart trouble. I've had sicknesses. I've had, couldn't even get, the, it's just a blessing to be able to preach today to me. You know, sometimes we take things for granted. I don't take health for granted any longer, I guarantee you. When you get my age, you won't take health for granted. I just thank God for health. But, you know, I told somebody the other day, Bruce, this wife that came, I said, you know, I had the hardest two years I've ever had in my life, but I've had the best two years <laughs> I've ever had. I said, I've been more happy and at peace the last year than I've ever been in my life. Even though it was the biggest struggle I've ever encountered. Well, how can you do this? Well, because of the revelation of the river of life, that's when I married that girl, I promised her, I said, remember I made the commitments right here. I'll never run you down. I'll never speak to you after the flesh. We're going to we're going to respond in the spirit. We agree. She and I both respond to one another in the spirit. So when you're going through hell and you're going through the storm, to have people around you that responds in the spirit realm and not in the flesh. You understand what I'm saying? We were happy. We were laughing. We were cutting up. Sometimes you thought we was teenagers. We, we met her talk big. We play with one another all the time. We, we, we always pick at one another. <laughs> you think we would? She tell me. She tell me. If you don't watch it, boy, I'll straighten you right up. <laughs> I get to laughing. You know, we just we play around. We we love one another, and when you got when you can have peace. Some of the greatest peace and happiness right in the midst of one of the worst years of your life. Why? Because what's outside can't penetrate the inside. Does this make any sense? When you've got God in here and you know you've got God and you know God's with you. We've, stuff, we've struggled financially. We've struggled physically. We've struggled just every way you can imagine, you know, as far as trying to, trying to get through. But you know what? I wouldn't trade it for anything. So these commitments we made to each other at our marriage vows, we're just staying with them. So we still never had our fight yet. We've had our times of silence, but we never had our fight. <laughs> I told her the other day, I said, honey, you are going to have to start embracing your mistakes in life. And she come up and give me a big hug. <laughs> I don't know what that's all about, but anyway. <laughs> You got to be able to laugh about it, folks. You got to be able to go through it. You got to be able to trust God through it all. I'm just thankful to be here. I'm like Minnie Pearl. I'm just glad to be here. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, I'm thankful. But you know what? I made up my mind a year and a half ago. I don't ever want anything in this life to pressure me into speaking after the flesh any longer. I never want to get mad enough that I'd say something I'd regret. And especially take it out on her. Because she's the one closest to you. Because if you can't live it in the home, you ain't going to live it anywhere. You know, you can put it on out there. When you see that these guys talking about how spiritual you are and their kids and their wives sitting there rolling their eyes. <laughs> you know. Uh, or like the woman at the funeral, when the preacher's bragging, he says, 
Son, go over and see if that's your daddy in that casket there. How many glad God has the power to keep his folks? Well, I'm going to just tell you right now, the storm will come. The Bible says it will. If you had not had a storm yet, you will have one. But I figure every one of us face storms of some kind every day. A sick child, a relative, something that we have to be pained about. But when we got God, we stay steadfast in faith during the storm. Praise God. Amen. And you got to help each other. When she has something, she tells me, well, you know what? Somebody did this so and so. I said, don't even worry about it, baby. We got God with us. Just don't even worry about it. Just dismiss it. Let's don't let it affect us. I said, don't let somebody else's failure cause us to be like them and fail God. Let it be on them. Don't let it be on us. Let's do what's right all the time. Best we can. And let the failure be on them. Don't let somebody else's negativity and somebody else's, you know, lack of spirituality bring you down to their level. Because we got God. And because we got God. I may be in a storm, but I'm steadfast in the storm. Amen. Let's all stand. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise God. And you may be going through one right now. I don't know. Uh, we've been praying for a lot of things around here, man. Businesses, all kind of things to happen. We need God to take place. But I appreciate the Lord. But I tell you one thing, I believe God's with us. you got to believe that. He said, I'm with you wherever you go. Amen. As long as you, as you, as long as you don't get in an airplane, you'll be all right. Because he said, and lo, I'm with you. Hallelujah. <laughs> now, he's going to be with you no matter where you're at. Through the fire, through the storm, through the flood, through the rain, everything. It says remain steadfast. Don't let it push you. And if you're studying, go back. You need to go back and read the Sermon on the Mount and think about what all Jesus is saying in it. Because he said, either hear these things and do it them like unto a wise man. And when these storms come, he's going to stand. Why? He don't respond to adversity. Producing fruit in adversity is the mark of maturity. Praise God. Because anybody can love those that's loving you. Amen. Let's thank the Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you right now for your spirit, your blessings, God. Ask you, Lord, that you touch each and every one today. Help us, Father. I believe this is so important, what I preach. Some may not believe so, but I believe it is. Because I think this is the way the church is going to reach the world. I believe this is the way the church is going to mature to the place that you want us to mature to. To the place that we refuse all sin. We refuse all words that's not of you. That we never criticize people. We never run people down. We, Lord, pray for them. And we believe God. And we don't have to carry any burdens. We don't have to carry any bitterness, God. We're free to have peace that passeth all understanding. We're free to have joy. We're free to be happy. We're free to love, God. We're totally free from all the shackles of this world and the sins that some people care to carry, Father. But we don't have to have that on us because we're your kingdom people. And we thank you for the freedom you've given us in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. You can be dismissed in Jesus' name. No, 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 no. They oh, may no, not. No. I forgot. They changed it up on me. We hadn't even had offerings.